Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Catholic Family News. I'm Murray Rundus, the production manager for CFN, and I'm pleased to be joined by Matthew Pleasy. Uh, Matthew has been on the show many times, uh, I guess one time before, right? Uh, and in addition to that, you're a prolific writer. Uh, you've written for Catholic Family News, written for the Fatima Center, and also, uh, most notably, uh, many good books. I think many people know you because of your book on fasting. And today we're going to be talking about your book, Restoring Lost Customs of Christendom. So thanks for coming on the show, Matthew. How have you been? I've been well. Thanks for having me. I'm always happy to support the work of Catholic Family News. It's an apostolate that I've really been honored to be a part of now for a number of years. So it's always good to see it succeeding. And I hope that God continues to really further the mission of this apostolate far and wide. Absolutely. And we, we thank you for being a part of this. And before we break down you know, some of the more uh, interesting details about your book, what really was the inspiration behind this book? Because I, you know, I see it as in a way sort of following from your, your book on fasting. Uh, and there seems to be some interconnected details there, mm -hmm. but what was the inspiration behind writing this one in particular? So the thing that a lot of people do know me for, as you noted, is my work on fasting. So I've been privilege really to share so much about that forgotten history with so many people. And it's been really enriching because it's really informed a lot of people's lives and they can therefore then live out the faith because we live in an era of doctrinal crisis. We live in a time in which the faith is not preached very openly, of which priests don't even really know about it, or if they do know about it, they're afraid to share it. So one of the things that I really like to do, whether that be for the Fatima Center, for Catholic Family News in my writings and in my speeches, is to really highlight things that are forgotten. So part of that is fasting. Fasting has been totally swept on the rug and we must rediscover that because that's something that you and I and our families and our parishes, we can do. We don't need anybody else. We don't need any permission. But the other flip side of that coin is customs. So I've said before several different times to places that there is a twofold way to help bring about restoration in our own families and one way we can do that is by observing fasting and abstinence. And the other side is feasting. So it's really fasting and feasting. You can't just have one. It's great to have robust fasting. And I believe strongly that we, mu that we must. But we also need a strong feasting. So what does it mean to feast with the church? What are those seasons of the year in which God has given us the opportunity to celebrate certain things and the harmonious interplay of fasting and feasting? So my book on customs really provides so much um, information for people on how to live out those feasts of the church. So there's a lot of customs associated with fasting, but what does it mean to feast right, to feast liturgically with the mind of the church? And that's what my book on customs has really gone to do. I think it is, along with fasting, something that is not talked about enough. And it's something I've really found that a lot of individuals, families, they just love doing because you don't need anybody's permission to live out some of these customs. And it really enriches your own life too. No, and that's that's so true. And we've been talking a lot on Catholic Family News recently about these these practical solutions to bring about the the kingship of Christ. And as you mentioned, these are all practical things we can do. When writing this book and when investigating these different customs, did you come about a a, a specific culture that you think had embodied the the spirit of of feasting in a way that you found uh, that was your favorite? Did did one culture stand out as being like, oh, this one this one really embodies a, a strong Catholic spirit? So the nice thing about doing this work is I've really tried to draw from a lot of different Catholic cultures around the around the globe. But you will find that it is heavily based on European customs because Europe, of course, is truly the cradle of Christendom. We have so much that we owe to the work of the monks uh, of the church throughout Europe, as well as the theologians of the Middle Ages and beforehand, which really brought about the Catholic culture that we have today. You know, in the United States, we are in a Christian culture to some extent. Uh, of course, it could be much more robust, but it's really a vestige of that culture that our European ancestors had that they loved. So much of the customs I talk about are things that people would just randomly do and do, you know, as part of their life. And, and some of that, like, for instance, you know, as we are around the time of Pentecost, 
just something that people would do in Europe is on the evening before Pentecost, that is the vigil of Pentecost, people would in Europe just go out in the fields and go to hills and pray on the hills to be closer to God because God descended and the Holy Ghost to people. And so you want to be closer to God. So you want to go up on the hill. That was just something they would do from the food they had to the colors they would wear to the processions. So much can be said about that. And there's a lot of diversity, though, amongst Europe. So Italian customs are certainly different than Hispanic ones or the French ones or further up north. You know, England is going to have a lot of different customs than maybe Greece. But to, despite these differences, that together uh, you could say that these European customs really exemplified and embodied that they wanted to live out the faith at all times. It was not something to be lived out every Sunday. And it certainly was not even something to be lived out each day, like going to daily mass and then you go about your day as if it didn't matter. No, everything that our ancestors did and established for us truly was connected to the liturgical year and the liturgical day and the liturgical week. So something that we can do is simply say that, well, this is some of the practices that they did. And again, these are mostly European ones, but how can we appropriate them and thus live some of them today? And that's kind of what I set out for a lot of people to do. So practical tips, because I don't like to just focus on things of theory. It's nice to learn these things happen, but it's not a history book. It's really a guide to how do you learn and live out these practices in our era today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's extremely important. And you mentioned that diversity when it comes to the, the European traditions and how America just really has vestiges of that culture. Do you see uh, American Catholicism as having developed its own customs, its own traditions, or do you think that we're we're sort of stuck in a way going and using those um, those traditions, those customs of before. Did American Catholicism develop its own customs from what you've seen? Well, unfortunately, I think that if you really look at history, we see that the faith has just outright um, deteriorated in many respects in public life. And this occurred even before America's founding. So, for instance, something that I study and I talk about throughout the book, as well as articles, for instance, at the Fatima Center I write on, is how, for instance, Holy Days of Obligation decreased significantly over time. In the year 1642, we had 36 days, but not all places kept all of them. And America was one of them, did not keep all of them. There was an interesting patchwork of if you were in different dioceses versus others, you might have different Holy Days. And it wasn't until 1885 that there was a unification in America of Holy Days. But in order to achieve this unification, they basically took the lowest common denominator of these different dioceses. So generally, if you were British colonies originally versus French territories acquired versus Spanish, you had vastly different ones. And in order for unification, they took away a lot of that. And unfortunately, by taking away a lot of that, they have reduced some of those customs that were otherwise going to be observed. And for instance, you know, as we are in this time of year, which Corpus Christi is coming up, Corpus Christi has wonderful uh, customs throughout Europe. You know, if we look at the processions, of which we do still have some in the United States, of course, Eucharistic procession, they should be more. But Corpus Christi was celebrated as an octave as well for a long time. In some parts of Europe, even in Eastern Europe, it was celebrated as the day of wreaths, where people would take green wreaths and they would put it on their door. And it was a symbol of rebirth, of renewal, somewhat also how in the Byzantine tradition, Pentecost color is green because it symbolizes birth and renewal and a new springtime for the church. But what happened in America? Well, we moved the celebration of Corpus Christi in 1885 and no longer made it a holy day of obligation. Instead, we have the external solemnity on the following Sunday. That is kind of divorced the uh, thought of Thursdays being holy and honor of the Blessed Sacrament here in America. And that's just one example of how do we help restore Eucharistic revival and discipline. That's something that I'm talking about now, especially in this year, as that's a discussion in the church. Well, one thing we can do is simply to go back to what our ancestors used to do. Unfortunately, we live in a United States where it is the case that for a long time, American Catholics were heavily persecuted. You know, very long ago in Virginia, if you were Catholic, you could not own firearms. You could not own ammunition. It was considered raw. It was illegal. I think it was also illegal for a long time to be Catholic in Savannah, Georgia. I remember when I visited Savannah last year, they talked about that one could not be Catholic until it actually became a state in the United States. Beforehand, when it was a colony, Catholics were not welcome. 
So a lot of Catholics, as you probably know, flocked to Maryland, and that was the colony for Catholics. So you will find more customs in Maryland as a result and more robust culture, at least traditionally and historically, in other parts, because it's simply that our faith was not allowed. It was not allowed to be practiced. And that has unfortunately rippled across. So we do live in an era where America was really heavily influenced by Protestant ideals. And what we certainly hope to is have a restoration of the church, of tradition, and a revival of the Catholic faith uh, in the United States, too. We want Catholic nations. We want the reign of Christ the King throughout our country. And unfortunately, there's just not a whole lot of robust American customs that have really withstood the test of time because so many people here focus on individual liberty or these ideas from the United States Constitution, which are unfortunately in some respects opposed to the Catholic faith, which is a monarchy where Christ is the true king. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think all of our, our European audience, they're a bit spoiled in a way because they can simply go back to the customs that, you know, their grandparents were, were celebrating and their grandparents, etc. cetera. For, um, for our American viewers, what would you recommend they, what, what types of customs would you recommend that they go to? Would you, would you recommend that they pick and choose from really just the, the best customs that they find most fruitful for them looking back, um, spe you know, specific things that they can celebrate with their families? Or would you recommend um, sort of synergizing it with uh, the, their, their various heritages that they, that they have? What do you think is best for, for Americans? Well, I think it depends on your family, on your own customs. Mm -hmm. For instance, I come from a family where um, I'm basically half Bavarian and, and Irish. So those customs are particularly important to me because I want to continue that in honor of my ancestors. I think it's important for all of us to pray for our ancestors, for their salvation. So so many people no longer pray for the dead. And we can and should pray for all the dead. But we should pray specifically for our ancestors. And in order to honor them, so then we can do is help restore those customs for those eras. But that doesn't mean that's the only things we should do. We should honor the faith in different ways. And to do so, I really heavily believe we need to observe the customs of liturgical year. So the customs of liturgical year are going to differ country to country. We might find that some of these customs resonate more with us. Even, for instance, if, you know, Italy has a lot of customs. You don't need to be Italian to observe some of them. You don't need to be of any Italian descent to say that some of these ways they honor, for instance, St. Agatha in Sicily, how we might view that in a very profound way. And we want to take some of those uh, customs ourselves. Same thing with German ones. That's certainly not the case. The Hispanic culture too has a lot of customs too. And um, the Portuguese, even in Asia, there's certain customs that were introduced into the church and into the liturgy there. And customs really build off of and show us the faith. So one instance that I like to talk about is in Japan, if you notice there in the traditional uh, mass, if you've ever seen pictures of that, the priest in Japan it wears a special hat on his head. And you might be surprised, why does he wear this square-like hat on his head there? And we might actually view it as inappropriate for a priest to, or any man to have a hat on his head at mass. But the priest does this because only the emperor would wear such a hat. So in a respect, the priest is showing his connection with Christ and Christ is the true emperor. And thus we see that that cultural usage of that particular custom to those people really emphasized that the Christ uh, was the high priest, that he was the true emperor, that he was their real savior, and he was on the level of the emperor or even greater in this case than the emperor. So that's something that we can maybe not observe in our own lives, but if we see pictures of that, understand that this diversity in customs really shows us that there can be true uh, diversity in customs while still maintaining the unity of the faith. So a lot of people forget about we have unity, obviously, Catholicity and dogma. But other than that, we can observe different practices. I know some people that observe the Annunciation Feast Day in a unique way. They actually throw almost a birthday party to celebrate that Christ is going to be born. And like they, this one man would have balloons and it would say, it's a boy. And he would celebrate with his kids. And that was his way of celebrating liturgically that in nine months we would be having Christmas and that Christ had become man. That's something he didn't draw from any European custom, but he found a lot of deep richness in liturgically celebrating that. Whereas in the East, Annunciation Day, 
uh, because it's during the strictness of the Lenten fast, was always practiced with a lot of rigor. But in the East, you could have fish on that particular day, while as most of the other times in Lent, they do not allow that. But that was their way of introducing uh, in uh, some sort of custom some way to celebrate the day, to make it a little bit different than the other days. So the great thing about being Catholic is we have holidays all year long. So let's live them out, you know, let's go through and understand what does it mean to actually live out these holidays? You know, people talk about Catholics maybe focus too much on sin or on the crucifixion or on depressing things. And if you actually lived a Catholic life, as I try to, some of the people who I know look and say, wow, those Catholics, they're just always having another holiday, you know, like <laughs> holiday after holiday. So it's something to be said about living the faith. It is really a joyful living. So you want to do that. And it gives you a great opportunity to do so very publicly. If people see like, oh, you have these customs, you know, you decorate this certain way, you have all these unique food customs. And it goes to show you how enriching the Catholic faith really is. Absolutely. And, you know, it's such a shame that, for example, things like the, the medieval age, which was full of this sort of, you know, this fruitful culture and, and happiness and real joy, it's branded as the dark ages. And I think we need more of that, that, that old spirit in us of, like you said, celebrating these, this year long holiday that we have going on um, throughout the year. You know, you mentioned about the the sort of decline from these cultures. And I think a, a lot of people might have a, a misconception that Vatican II was the origin point of all of this sort of decline when, of course, it was the, uh, I would say it's the floodgates opening up. But is there a specific point in history that you see the decline to, to begin? Was there a specific spirit that swept through the church, a spirit that swept through the temporal world that, that led to this sort of decline where we have, you know, we've forgotten, as I think, you know, as the... Um, as your book title is, The Lost Customs. We've lost all of these customs. When do you think this, this process really began? Well, I think there's a few different uh, instances in history that were really critical. But I think the most critical was the Renaissance, where modern man really asserted he wanted to achieve this humanistic vision, that he had it in his power to do things, that he wanted to pursue things with his own ambitions and his own self and we talk about like great paintings in the renaissance and renaissance thought and culture you know we think of florence but at the same time if we look at the the life of the church the church kind of began to take a back seat and if we look there even by that point holy days of obligation were significantly reduced the amount of fasting and absence days had also continues to decline by this point the advent fast for instance is long gone People begin to chip away at the observance of Lent. 1741 was the year famously when Pope Benedict XIV first allowed meat ever to be had during Lent. And it was really brought about by that humanistic influence of the Renaissance paving the way sometime before this. So the, I don't think there's any really one year where it really happened. But I will say the Renaissance was a really significant time globally where we see things continue to deteriorate and the church is still trying to be a beacon of life and doctrine but people no longer view the church as everything centered around this whereas in the heights of the middle ages we see that despite the wars despite the pestilence despite of course personal sin of course we do see people still looking to the church as that beacon that city set on a hill and in the Renaissance, we no longer have that. And that's not the case, of course, in all places. Some places still retain it. You know, you can still have the faith and some customs. But that's when I began to really think that we see the luster begin to fade. Here in America, I think one of those key moments, because this is different than the Renaissance one, one of the key moments where American Catholics began to really acquiesce to the culture was the election of JFK. I think that was significant because we finally had a Catholic president. Catholics felt like outsiders for so long. As I mentioned, you couldn't even be Catholic in a lot of these colonies. If you were, you were really a second or third class citizen. You weren't allowed the rights of others. Even when America became founded, Catholics weren't the same. They were discriminated against. Uh, for instance, Irish and Italian were considered not actually white, not actually Americans. You need not apply for these jobs. This continued propaganda against Catholics continued for a long time. We see that as well. If you're familiar with Al Smith, when he ran for president in the early 1900s, the cartoons against him. Right now, if those were to be aired, like people would be shocked at how really abhorrent they were attacking Catholics. And, and uh, people should rightfully talk about how discriminatory they uh, were overtly. 
And so if you look him up, you'll find out how really horrible it was to be a Catholic in that sense, because you were going to be discriminated against. And of course, we have the KKK in America doing uh, untold atrocities, too, against Catholics because they hate Catholics. So finally, we have the election of JFK. And I feel like Catholics are like, we finally made it. We don't want to be an outsider anymore. We don't want to be that European religion that happens to be practiced here. We just want to become American like everybody else. And I think that at that moment, if you look in history, there's kind of that giving in of we'll just do mostly the same things. Maybe we go to a different church, but we all, you know, get along. It's okay. And we're Americans too now, so we made it. And we no longer need those special customs that make us so different. So I think... For Americans, that was the going off the cliff. And Vatican II just exacerbated it because it made it seem like dogma, that one thing that was keeping us different didn't really matter. You know, any religion can be saved. You know, religious indifferentism reigns. We have a new humanistic mass put in. So that just beyond accelerated off the cliff. But beforehand, I think that, you know, we do have those moments like the Renaissance globally and JFK's election here in America, which really brought about the problem we're in. Mm -hmm. And talk about a betrayal. I, I think that's that's a very wise point. I also think it's wise to trace the influences back to the, the humanistic renaissance. I think most of our problems can really stem back to that. So I think that's that's very true. You know, as a solution to this, you know, you've mentioned the, these customs. We Let's break down some of them. We've, we've got one, um, a great feast coming up, of course, the Feast of Pentecost. And, you know, before we, we talk about the, the different details about it, I want to ask you about the name, because I think this causes a lot of confusion with some people. You've got uh, Pentecost or Whit Sunday, right? And I think more... Um, People involved in the sort of Anglosphere, Anglophile world, or get, might hear um, Whit Sunday sometimes. Mm -hmm. What is the what is the meaning um, of both of those terms? Why are they used separately? Right, uh, that's a good question, and I will throw in the third. It's also called in some places White Sunday, and Whit Sunday is really just a take on the the White Sunday. And that particular name is used because along with Easter, um, Pentecost was the day in which baptisms were most widely performed. So if you were an adult convert and you you know, did not receive baptism for one reason or another at Easter, this was really the next opportunity. So there was a special, uh, in the ancient church, the Vigil of Pentecost was celebrated in the night, just like the Easter Vigil. It would have a number of readings too, uh, and I believe 12 readings as well on the Vigil of Pentecost, and it would be celebrated and culminate in the baptism of the catechumens who still remained. So thus they would then celebrate. They would wear their, their white vestments throughout the whole octave of Pentecost. So it was in a sense, another kind of Easter. So if you even take your missal and you look, there's special prayers for um, during the canon of the mass, during Easter in its octave and Pentecost in its octave. So Pentecost is a particularly important day. And Whit Sunday, it, White Sunday, refers to those baptism, that new generation that brought about by the Holy Ghost and those who have been baptized. Now, Pentecost, the pent comes from, you know, five or 50, because we are 50 days after Easter. But what's interesting to note, and I really like to highlight this, is this really shows how the New Testament is not a new creation in and of itself. It really does, as Christ said, continue the Old Testament, perfect it, complete it, and further us in this new era of the New Testament and Christ's blood and, and his grace. And that's because Pentecost was an Old Testament feast day. Most people don't realize that, that it was instituted. And what if the Jews right now talk about keeping Pentecost, what they're referring to is the keeping of the observance when God gave Moses the two commandments, the, to, uh, the Ten Commandments and the two stone tablets. That's what their Pentecost celebrates, the reception of the law by Moses. But we don't just receive a law, we receive God himself, uh, not on stone tablets, but engraved on your heart in confirmation, the true infusion of the Holy Ghost. So when you understand that and you understand what does Pentecost mean, it's connection with the Old Testament, it becomes more profound because it is not just the observance of a law, observe this and you might be my chosen people, but I give you myself, not just my own law. So I think that's particularly profound. So I'm glad you mentioned the meaning of these names because a name is important. You know, we call things by names for a reason. And that's, and that's uh, to be duly noted that the name of Pentecost is important for that reason. Mm -hmm. and that's that's so profound. It just shows the the beauty of the Catholic faith in the continuity we have with Holy Scripture and the Old Testament. It's beautiful stuff. You know, what would you say is a way that 
Catholics in our homes can express Pentecost, you know, and, and it really show forth this, this custom? Are, are there any things that we can do as communities and as families uh, to celebrate this feast? Well, one thing I like to do is I like to observe those liturgical colors. So, you know, red is typically associated with Pentecost here in the, the Western church. So, um, you know, I do know some people who like to have fresh flowers put in their house every week or, or pretty often. It would be a great day for red flowers, for roses to decorate tables, for instance, is in the symbol of the Holy Ghost, especially because we have the custom of the roses. You're familiar with in Rome, the Pantheon, those rose petals are dropped through the oculus in the temple. That's a custom, and it shows visibly what happened invisibly, that the Holy Ghost comes as tongues of fire on the apostles. And that custom is still observed here in Chicago at St. John Cantius Parish. They do that. They drop roses still from the transept of the church on the whole congregation at the end as the Come Holy Ghost hymn is recited. So we can, of course, pray for the coming of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's something we can do as a family, but we can also decorate our home in roses, which is not only red, but it's also in, um, you know, fidelity and uh, in union with this custom, uh, which is occurring. So I think that's something that we might want to do. And for those of us drawn to Eastern customs, as I mentioned before, the Byzantine tradition associates Pentecost with a whole new rebirth of creation because God has given himself in this rebirth. So green is the color there. So if you're drawn to Eastern Catholic customs, it'd be great to decorate the home in green and to keep it as such throughout the whole octave. And something that we might also want to do is to understand that one, of course, Pentecost has an octave. Unfortunately, it was abolished in the Novus Ordo by Paul VI. But in the traditional right, of course, we still have that Pentecost octave. But what most people don't realize is that the Monday and Tuesday of that octave were holy days of obligation for a long period of time. Pentecost Tuesday, along with Easter Tuesday, remained a holy day until around 1778. And Pentecost Monday, along with Easter Monday, actually, was kept on the official list until it was removed by St. Pius X in the early 1900s. So something we can do as well is go to Mass on these days. Even if we're not obliged to now, make an effort to go to Mass on Pentecost Monday and Pentecost Tuesday to keep that tradition that people used to observe under obligation. And the last uh, thing that I'll mention is going into Pentecost Wednesday is we have the Ember Days of uh, Pentecost too. And it really is interesting because we have fasting and absence days during an octave showing that there is no diametric opposition to having a joyful fast. The church always looked at this as we can fast joyfully. So we are celebrating the reception of the Holy Ghost in our souls. And there's nothing wrong with fasting and abstaining uh, and, and offering to God this sacrifice. So I think that's a wonderful source of meditation, too. And even if some people want to say, oh, well, we're not obliged to do this now. No, we should be observing the Ember Days. So there's actually quite a bit we can do to live liturgically uh, throughout the whole octave of Pentecost. Yeah, and I think that was that was one of the um, things I found most interesting in your book is how the colors don't change on those ember days. That's that's very interesting. It doesn't, doesn't change to violet. And that importance of a joyful fast, I think that's so key because, like you said, it's very connected with the Catholic faith. You know, you mentioned these octaves, and that's something I think in the modern church people just have no clue about. It's something that, of course, you know, the Novus Ordo, it's suppressed a lot of that. And could you maybe tell our audience, what, what's the importance with these octaves after these great feasts? Well, octaves are really modeled after the fact that when our Lord ascended into heaven, there was a period of time afterwards with the apostles and Our Lady praying, waiting for that descent of the Holy Ghost. And we find that octaves are, are really eight-day celebrations, oct from eight. You know, we talk about octagons and, and other things to start with eight. So anybody with a little rudimentary Latin should know we're referring to eight here. So it's basically a week-long celebration. So, for instance, we should be familiar that Easter and Christmas have octaves. That is, the feast is, is longer than one earthly day, you might say, that in heaven it lasts longer and we celebrate it for eight days. And um, a lot of the problems that we have with people understanding octaves now is we only have a few. So people think that they're in such a way in which if you had all these octaves, then you'd have no other liturgical days. That It would only be, you know, the octave of Christmas and that's it. But even somebody who's a little bit familiar with Catholic liturgy should know even the day after Christmas is the Feast of St. Stephen, even though it's still in the octave of Christmas. And the next day is uh, going to be St. John the Evangelist, even though it's still in the octave 
of Christmas. So that does not mean that because you're in an octave that every single day in the octave is a holy day of obligation. It does not mean that you can't have other celebrations. St. Pius X and before him, Leo XIII organized octaves in different ways so they would be different rankings. But as you said, a lot of these octaves were eliminated by Vatican II. But I should say that if you went to the 1962 Missal, there's still only three octaves there. There's that Christmas one, there's that Easter one, there's the Pentecost one. It was really Pius XII who removed most octaves. Uh, so unfortunately, that's why we no longer have octave of the Ascension in the 62 Missal, or we don't have it of the Assumption. We don't have it even of St. Lawrence. He used to have an octave as well. If we look at um, St. Uh, Stephen, St. John the Evangelist, the Holy Innocents, they had octaves too. So they would sometimes be overlapping octaves. And it really shows this unique patchwork in the liturgical year, how you could have many different celebrations on one particular day. And this is something, unfortunately, I feel like modern Catholics don't realize is just because it's a feast day of one particular saint, that doesn't mean it's not also the feast of other saints too. So pick up a copy of the Martyrology. I talk about the Martyrology throughout my book, too. One thing we can be doing in our own lives is reading from it every day. You might be surprised that there might be 20 or 30 saints celebrated on that particular day. Even if you go to Mass, you only hear the name of one of them. There are still others commemorated on that day liturgically, in addition to all these other saints, of course, whose names we don't know. So there's a lot of ways we can do to live out liturgical year like that. But octaves trip people up because they don't understand what exactly an octave is and the different rankings of privileged ones, uh, you know, and there's different rankings uh, and uh, of that. But the book does talk about that and more information. But living octaves is something we should do. For instance, Corpus Christi is coming up, you know, in a few weeks. Corpus Christi is a great way for us to live out the, this whole octave too in a year in which we're talking so much about Eucharistic revival, don't just be um, content with celebrating Corpus Christi on that Thursday and then forgetting about it. We don't need to hear the mass of the octave at the chapels and churches we go to. We can keep in our own lives the prayers of that octave, you know, at your own home altar each morning and each evening and connect to that uh, liturgy occurring in heaven. Even our blessed Lord referred to the octave of Corpus Christi. When he appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alico and asked for the institution of the Sacred Heart, he referred to it as um, in reference to the octave of Corpus Christi. So if our Lord himself refers to octaves, that should also be a further indication that he blesses the observance of this period of time of eight days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. And, you know, Matthew, I think there's really an attitude difference when it comes to the, the modern church and really just traditional Catholic thought. And I think some of the, the modern lack of practice has sort of bled through. And, and one of these things that I, I see that in is the, the Sundays after Pentecost, which, of course, in the Novus Ordo, it's often referred to as ordinary time. What would you say is the way that traditional Catholics, Catholics that want to take the liturgical season more seriously, how should we approach these Sundays after Pentecost? Yeah, so it's very easy to fall into the rut of they're just period of waiting until Advent, that you got nothing going on, you're just waiting until Advent. And I encourage a lot of people, so I still, I do a podcast of my own, the A Catholic Life podcast, and I refer to a lot of people the need to keep your Lenten resolutions at this time and find ways to improve your life. You know, you probably set out and during Lent or even at the beginning of the year to you wanted to do certain things better in the faith and you wanted to root out bad habits. This, unfortunately, I feel like is a period in which a lot of people are more prone to going on vacation, nothing wrong with vacation. But when the faith takes a backseat and nothing normal is, ha you know, is happening and it's just routine, there's nothing special, people no longer view that in the sense that I feel like they, they should. So one thing we can do is uh, praying and reading through different meditations for the liturgical year. So whether that be, um, you know, I have ones by Father Pius Parsh that each Sunday I read through and he really talks a lot about uh, dogmatic and doctrinal implications of the readings as well as moral ones and ways in which we can live out the faith uh, you know, in our own lives. So season after Pentecost can really be, you know, to unfortunately, a lot of people somewhat boring, not very interesting, but we have a lot of great saints days coming up through out this period too, whether that be in July, we have the Feast of the Precious Blood. In August, of course, we have our Blessed Mother's Feast of Her Assumption. And something that I talk about in my book too is that 
In the East, um, what they do is they observe a two-week period of fasting leading up to the assumption called the Dormition Fast, something we might want to do in order to keep living liturgically at this period of time is to keep those two weeks as days of fasting and absence and then fittingly celebrate the assumption and its octave leading into the Immaculate Heart. So August is actually a very robust month. And especially if you do the certain blessings throughout the year, for instance, the Assumption Day has a lot of different blessings of herbs associated with it in the Roman ritual. So read, as I talk about in the book, tell your priest you want him to do these blessings, because if he thinks nobody's interested, he's not maybe not going to offer it. But say we want to have the blessing of herbs. We want to understand how it's connected to our Blessed Mother's uh Dormition and her assumption, and how there were all these herbs at her tomb, and thus we bless them and we remember her uh, end of her life and her assumption, or at her nativity as we celebrate the beginning of September. That's the day in which we would traditionally bless grapes because in Europe it was the unofficial end of summer, the fall harvest was coming in, and you would bless all these grapes. So it's great to see people coming forward and saying, Hey, we would love our priest to bless all these grapes because we want to be connected to that tradition. We're honoring our Blessed Mother's birthday. All of that's occurring in this period of time after Pentecost. So it's not just waiting until Advent. Of course, we have that great triduum too of Halloween leading into All Saints Day and All Souls Day and all the customs associated with that. But you uh, hit a very good point that the Sundays after Pentecost to many people are just not very interesting. But I think that if we focus on the readings, we pair that with sermons and other things of good Catholic sources, we'll find a lot of richness in them because above all, we have celebrated liturgically everything from Christ's incarnation to his birth, throughout his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the descent of the Holy Ghost, the revelation of the Trinity. And now these should be focused on how do you actually live out a Catholic life? What does it mean? What are the moral implications of that? And let's continue to understand those mysteries more as we look forward to the eventual second coming of Christ. That's how you live out liturgically the seasons after Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And that just shows how beautiful our faith is and how interconnected everything is. It's just, it's amazing to be Catholic. And, you know, if, if you had to kind of bring things to a close, Matthew, if you had somebody that came up to you and said, you know, I, I love all this stuff, but I'm kind of feeling overwhelmed. There's so much new here. There's, there, there's so much to dig into. If you had to tell that person one thing that they could do, uh, for he or she to implement this into, uh, into his family. What would you what would you tell them to do? You know, I would say start small. So if you get a copy of the book and you find one particular custom that resonates with you, do that custom, you know, and build on from there. That doesn't what it doesn't mean is all of these are cool customs. I understand they're all very enriching. We're just going to do them all. And thus it becomes more of a burden than anything else. We can find great richness above all in uniting our lives with the liturgical year and thus continuing to journey with our Lord. Of course, all time comes from God. The whole day should be consecrated to him, whether it's morning prayer, evening prayer, daily mass. The week too, we see Friday abstinence, so important. Sunday mass, so important. But even Wednesday abstinence, we see Saturday abstinence. We see honoring the different votive masses throughout the week. So the week takes its own character. The month takes its own character with different customs associated with the month. We're in May right now. That's the honor of our Blessed Mother principally. So we can observe different customs this particular month. And throughout the year, we have different customs as well through the season. So we don't have to do everything. We don't have to be a whole patchwork of these different things. But we should be making a conscious effort. So I think it's important to do something rather than nothing. And typically, if you find that, you know, you find a lot of value in some of these keep them. If you don't with some of these customs, then don't keep them. Of course, we have to observe all the church requires of us. So if it's a precept of the church still, we have to observe that. But these extras, these customs, they should be enriching. They should not be a burden. And I find a lot of families and individuals as they look through this, find it really interesting. For instance, we just had the Ascension not long ago. And the food customs of that day were typically people would eat birds because Christ flew to heaven, it was said. And that also was a connection with his ascension. So food customs are really, I think, very interesting because you have the fasting uh, element of that and the feasting one. So if you wanted to start small and adopt just one thing, I would say look at the food customs. 
because if you adopt some of these throughout the year, you'll find, because obviously people have to eat, it's a way to really live out liturgically in a concrete way, you, yourself and your family, this connection to liturgical year. Yeah, beautiful stuff and great advice there. Matthew, if people want to check out your works and, and your, your podcast, as you mentioned, and your, your blog, where can people find you? Uh, well, I'm on a couple different things, but if you go to acatholiclife.blogspot.com, you'll find some of my articles there as well as links to my podcast. And I hope people would subscribe because a lot of things I do is it's just 15, 20 minute episode every Sunday posted and talks really about liturgical year living is really what it is for highlights for the coming week. So you can check me out there and you can also check out the courses that I offer at catechismclass.com on the traditional Catholic faith and what does it mean to actually be Catholic now. We live in an era like, you know, as you would know, unfortunately, not everything is taught to us. And so many people are adults saying, did I actually learn the Catholic faith? Was I properly catechized? So I offer courses for adults and children to make sure that everybody's properly catechized because you have to know the faith and then you got to live out the faith, but you can't live it out if you don't know it. So it's really two part, just like as I talked about with the book, it's a liturgical living, which is feasting and fasting. I think you need both. Absolutely. And we'll have links to all of that in the description below. And if you want to see more interviews like this to our audience, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out the large amount of interviews that we have like this on our channel. Or you can subscribe to our monthly paper that we also produce. So to all of our audience, may God grant you many joyful years.